Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. The largest land mammal in the world is the African elephant. Large bulls weigh six tons, and females are half that size. How the elephants live in their family groups and their natural behavior in the wild are the object of an extensive study. That study by a young American woman naturalist was first undertaken some five years ago and the research area selected is one of the only areas remaining where the elephant herds are still in a natural state. That area is Amboseli National Park, here in the African country of Kenya, near the foot of Africa's tallest peak, Kilimanjaro. The study is being conducted here by scientist Cynthia Moss under the auspices of the African Wildlife Leadership Foundation. Sometimes she uses sophisticated methods of radio telemetry in order to trace the movements of and accurately locate from the air the different family groups of elephants which roam this habitat of the Amboseli Basin. Many thousands of animals, including upwards of 600 elephants, inhabit this area. While some of her observations are made from the air, by far most are in close proximity to the animals, often within mere feet of them. Although this area receives only 10 inches of rainfall annually, which places it in desert category, the melting snows of Kilimanjaro feed a perpetual swamp system from underground water. Here at Old Tukai Orok is the research camp established by Cynthia Moss. Amboseli National Park provides an ideal situation for watching elephants. The 500 to 600 elephants living here are neither heavily hunted nor compressed into a restricted area. In addition, they have lived with the local inhabitants, the Maasai tribe, in relative harmony for the last two to three hundred years. As a result, they are remarkably tame, and they are one of the last undisturbed elephant populations in Africa. The information I gather here on their natural behavior should help in the future management of undoubtedly less natural populations. The camp is located near the swamp and strategically placed in the midst of the area where the elephant herds are moving about. This is advantageous because it means that it's never necessary for Cynthia to travel very far to make her daily observations. Each day's research into the social behavior of the elephants increases our knowledge of their life history. Because of man's encroachment for settlement, agriculture, cattle raising, or industry, the elephant's natural way of life is rapidly and forever disappearing. Up ahead is a typical group, females and young, led by a matriarch. And they are not alarmed because Cynthia Moss and her vehicle have become a familiar sight. My presence among them is so accepted by the elephants that even this calf begins to nurse. He is two years old and will nurse until about age six. He'll remain with the group until puberty at about age 14. An adult male occasionally joins the group for a day. I call this bull Karen called. He is not accustomed to my vehicle and his wariness slightly alarms the others. I have recorded 57 different family groups in the Amboseli Basin, ranging from two to 20 individuals. In their adult lives, it is very rare for male elephants to fight. However, as young bulls, early on they spar and test their strength to establish dominance. Later on, they don't have to fight. They know who is strongest. Between teenagers, such sparring is very common. These two combatants are about 17 years old and newly independent. Ah! 
They don't belong to the nearby family group, but are just visiting it temporarily. As with all teenaged males, they were ejected from their family group by adult females on reaching about age 14. There's a great importance in the observations made here. Elsewhere, elephant range has been reduced so that overpopulation results. But they aren't compressed at Amboseli, and a natural existence still occurs. This solitary bull I call Saibulu recognizes the vehicle and isn't alarmed. His crossing in this dusty area gives me an opportunity to determine the size of his footprint, which can aid the research. Measuring the footprint helps in determining the animal's age, and that measurement is done with a large set of calipers. The length of this print is 20 inches, indicating he's 40 to 50 years old. I gave Saibulu his name after a Maasai friend. These footprint measurements are important statistics because I am trying to determine the age of every elephant in the study area. Knowing the age structure of the population indicates to me whether these elephants are increasing in numbers or declining. Even though they are a familiar animal which most people recognize easily, elephants have many behavior traits not understood by us. And the more we learn of their social organization, movement, and habits, the better we'll be able to protect them. Cynthia Moss finished her observations of the first matriarchal family group of elephants and continued her drive a few more miles toward where she hopes to find more elephants. However, on the way, she discovers some elephant bones in an area she has not passed through recently. Such remains can be of value in her studies. There is no way to be certain how this animal died or was killed, but the lower jawbone teeth are an excellent indicator of age. An elephant has six sets of molars in its lifetime. Those of this bull elephant are the fifth set, indicating he was a fully mature animal, 40 to 50 years old, when he died. It's possible the elephant was wounded by a poacher outside the park and came for safety here, but then died. Cynthia will take the entire jawbone back to camp for closer study later. The dry season is the best time of year for Cynthia's studies because that is when elephants and other wildlife congregate here. Later, the elephants, wildebeest, zebras, and other plains animals will move away in search of more desirable vegetation when the rainy season comes. The elephants often stand in shade during the heat of the day, and Cynthia Moss finds this is a good time for observing them. It is, of course, vitally important to recognize individual elephants to study their behavior. One recognition factor is tusks, which vary in shape and size. Sometimes they will be straight and narrow, as in this female. Tusk shape is an inherited factor, carrying through the generations. Broken tusks can be a means of recognition, as are instances where only one tusk grows naturally. But tusks are not the most reliable method for identification because broken ones grow again and good ones break. Experience has shown that earmarks are a far more reliable means of identification. Often there are notches in the ear edges caused by being torn on thorns or branches. No two are the same. Identification can also be aided by warts, such as this one in front of the elephant's ear. When an elephant backs into a family group, as this one is doing, it is a non-aggressive approach. 
The tusks are weapons, and so the backing in eliminates any impression that the new arrival is threatening. Ear flapping is a cooling device used by all elephants. Sometimes the elephants will use their feet and trunks in concert while feeding. About 80% of their food here is grasses. An adult feeds about 16 hours per day and eats upwards of 300 pounds of foliage daily. Often when relaxing, the elephant will rest its trunk over a tusk. Equipped with very sensitive tips, the trunk can do an extraordinary variety of jobs, not the least of which is quite adequately scratching an ear. The observations I record like this each day help me understand more accurately how elephants react to one another within their own group and between groups. Elephants do not establish territories, but some of the animals here do, such as this Thompson's gazelle. He is preparing to mark grasses in his territory with a secretion from glands at his eye corners. This deposited scent alerts other Tommies that this is his territory. The next observation area for the day is closer to the swamps. The location I'm approaching now is where the moisture from Kilimanjaro has formed an extensive marsh with water eight feet deep and lush vegetation. These swamps provide water and food for the numerous animals which concentrate here in the dry season. Marshes such as this also provide a permanent home for certain animals. In areas where open water is available live many hippopotamuses. These huge animals live in small herds of about 15 individuals of both sexes and any age. Usually close by in the vegetation is the marsh bird called the African jacana, which is very common here and unafraid of the hippos. In fact, it often stays quite close to the hippos to snatch up any insects which might be disturbed by the movements of the hippos in the vegetation. It is most unusual for the hippos to leave the water during the day. Their outer skin, unlike that of any other mammal, is surprisingly thin and delicate and rather susceptible to ultraviolet rays from the sun. These are the second largest animals of Ambicelli after the elephant, weighing up to 7,000 pounds. The Ambicelli hippos are unusual in that they sometimes eat the vegetation in the water where they live. Normally, hippos feed at night, moving a mile or two away from the water for the grasses they prefer. The next place I'm going to will be Longinia Swamp, where several large elephant herds have been sighted and where further observations of their natural habits can be recorded. Cynthia Moss continued to move along the edge of the swampy area where there was less open water and more grass to observe the largest elephant family group in Ambacilli. She is so familiar to them that they simply ignore her, showing their trust. Sometimes the elephants will come within six feet and even reach out gently with their trunks and touch the vehicle. Such peaceful conditions are best for observing natural behavior. A sort of mock courtship behavior has begun between two adolescents. The 11-year-old female may mate in another year and have her first calf 22 months later. Often the young females of the group help care for the smaller calves in the manner that this five-year-old affectionately tends a yearling. Identification is essential, and this book, with over 300 photos, is an important tool in recognition. That adult female with one tusk is not too difficult to identify. The females of a particular group were all given names beginning with the same letter of the alphabet. This is group P, and this particular elephant is named Phoebe.
cattle egrets very commonly accompany elephants. They are tolerated by the elephants and often perch on them like this. The egrets stay close to snatch up insects disturbed by the elephants moving through the grass. Another resident of the marsh is the ibis. Here, a fledgling Hadada ibis is begging for food from the parent bird. The Amboseli marshes are important, not only as water and food sources, but equally for their mud. Mud wallowing is engaged in at least once a day. It cools, helps to dislodge ticks, and may even act as a protection against solar radiation. Here comes a good example of what is called displacement. The young calf rubbing against the stump very readily gives way to a large bull I call Agamemnon. Though he wouldn't be apt to hurt the youngster, it's a good example of how dominance operates. For a good while, Agamemnon takes enjoyment out of dislodging ticks from the tender skin around his mouth. He is not the most dominant bull here, and he is displaced in his own turn. In the hierarchy established long ago, Agamemnon learned that he must give way to the more dominant bull, Cyclops. My identification filing system for the males differs from that for the females, since males do not form stable groups. In this identification box on bull elephants, there are punched cards for 150 different animals. Ear and tusk characteristics are coded to punched holes. If, for example, I see a bull with a broken right tusk and push through the selector rod, only those cards matching this physical characteristic drop out. These few will undoubtedly provide me with the identification of the adult male presently standing not far away from the vehicle. Though I'd recognize that ear notch and broken tusk quite easily without the card, there can be no mistake made with identification as positive as this. It is the individual I named Bad Bull because he has something of a temper and he once tracked down my vehicle and seriously charged me. It is possible on that occasion that some physical ailment irritated him. He has had no similar temper manifestation since then and he'll probably never bother me again. Sometimes bulls like this will disappear for months at a time. Our knowledge of how far the male's range is limited. Radio tracking of the bulls may enlighten us. When different family groups temporarily merge, as sometimes occurs, and has just happened here, good observations may be made. Their greetings involve the trunks gently touching the mouths of each other. This is where I'll time some of the group interactions which are occurring. Twelve-year-old bulls like this seek one another out and greet, but then soon will test each other. Even the younger calves seek out other calves of the same age when groups merge. At this young age, personality differences already are obvious. The duration and incidence of the interactions are recorded on a special data sheet. The information obtained about such social activities can then be transferred to computer cards for later analysis. This will then provide us a base for establishing what normal behavior is. Every day, my research provides me with new insights into the lives of these intelligent animals. The long-term observations will undoubtedly help us better to understand and protect the African elephant. The elephants of Amboseli are more fortunate than most members of their species because so far they have escaped the growing encroachment of human populations and the relentless pursuit for their ivory tusks. But the largest land mammal has proportionally large requirements 
and thus, in a world of diminishing wild space, its chances of survival are slimmer than most animals. Too soon, all elephants will be restricted to national parks, where it is necessary for man to interfere in order to maintain elephants in balance with their environment. I hope that this study will provide some of the data necessary for making those management decisions. The studies being conducted by Cynthia Moss at Ambicelli are extremely important in teaching us more about how wild African elephants live in their natural state. Without being under the management control provided for other elephants in limited range areas, these elephants of Ambicelli provide today's scientists with insights into the natural history and ecology of elephants not possible anywhere else. If such vitally important natural habitat areas as the Ambicelli Basin were to be lost, it would be a tragedy to wildlife. It is a matter of urgency, therefore, for us to preserve and protect such areas, and in doing so, provide a healthy home for the animals which cannot exist without such a portion of the wild kingdom.